Let us begin our worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. <laughs> Glory be to God on high. for the readings. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. There will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. The word of the Lord.
A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. <clears throat> now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas, Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word of the Lord. Follow me, and I will. 
Praise be to the old. sermon that I thought I'd be preaching today, but last summer, General Convention approved a resolution called Foundation of Religious Life Sunday to be held each year on the third Sunday of Epiphany. On this day, we are expected to educate our congregation about what religious and other Christian communities have to offer to the church. And according to Justin Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury, it's a lot. In a 2018 speech, he said, you might think that monks and nuns are something from history, but that's not true at all. From traditional cloistered communities to young people taking one-year monastic vows, religious communities are being renewed across the church, and it's wonderful. Such communities offer an ancient and powerful answer to the loneliness and isolation we see in modern society. They are powerhouses of prayer. They serve the poorest and most vulnerable around them. They are a source of joy, wisdom, and inspiration for the church. These are mighty powerful words. Just to clarify, the canons of the Episcopal Church separate religious orders from what they call other Christian communities. While both types of communities are societies of Christians in community with the See of Canterbury, who voluntarily commit themselves for a life or a term of years in obedience to their rules and constitutions, there are just two differences. Traditional religious communities have to be celibate, and they have to hold all things in common. Other Christian communities can choose to do that, but they don't have to. You may be wondering why community and holding all things in common is so important. Maybe because the first Christians, following the teachings of their Lord, were intentional about forming communities like this. As described in Acts 2 and 4, in contrast to the oppression and violence of the empire of Rome, these early Christians formed small communities that practiced living the kingdom of God. According to Acts 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Similarly, in Acts 4, we hear that the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possession, but everything they owned was held in common. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. That is the Christian ideal. They were close-knit worshiping communities who lived out Jesus' teaching of the Sermon of the Mount and the great commandment to love God and neighbor. They took seriously St. Paul's injunction in Romans 12 
not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. By their lives, they were assigned to the world around them that something had changed, that the kingdom of God was breaking into the world through Jesus' death and resurrection, and would one day take over completely. Today's religious and other Christian communities seek the same thing, to live an authentic Christian life by loving each other and their neighbors, showing by their lives a vision of the kingdom of God that looks radically different from the world around them. They call the faithful to reevaluate their relationship to God and to the world. As a rule, they're trained and formed by traditions and practices that foster spiritual growth, discernment, and the kind of love that God as Trinity has and has had from the beginning. A love of mutual self-giving, self-offering, a love that spills over in hospitality to all in Christ's name. My community, the community of Mary, Mother of the Redeemer, or CMMR, is technically a Christian community because we are not celibate. We are open to people from all walks of life, married, single, celibate, of every gender and sexual orientation. But like traditional religious, we take vows to our rule of life, which for us includes vows of simplicity, chastity, and obedience. We share all things in common. We pray the daily office and have daily mass. We offer hospitality to all who come to our door and we attend to those in need, especially because it's my calling to those in prison. We are also very concerned with formation of the whole person, so teaching and offering spiritual direction are important to us, as is growing our own food to the extent possible. We hope to be living on a working farm someday. But worship comes first. We order our lives around the times of the four offices and mass every day. This provides the structure of our days, and everything else we do has to fit in between those times. And sometimes people ask, what is it you actually do? As if they don't believe that prayer does anything. <laughs> but we believe that the act of prayer is itself a ministry to the church and to the world. We pray with trust that God will use our prayers for the benefit of those we pray for in the way that he sees fit. I'll tell you that if you had told me 15 or 20 years ago that this would be my life, I would have laughed at you. That is not how I grew up. But I made my first monastic retreat in July 2009 at the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky, and my whole life changed. I was transfigured by the beauty of the monks chanting, by the ringing of the bells, by the profoundly simple joy of the silence and stillness and just being in the presence of God. So much so that the following Easter, I was baptized. I went back to Gethsemane every summer for about eight or nine years. But I also found an Episcopal monastery in upstate New York, which is about an hour and a half from where I lived, where I not only made week-long retreats, but I spent every Friday there, from morning prayer at 7 till Compline at 8.30, every Friday that I could do that. I still, though, could not imagine actually living that life. There's a saying about life and community. It's not difficult, but it's relentless. I actually find it to be both. You can't live in community and not become aware of your every flaw, your every sin, every way that you try to escape intimacy with others, as well as God's love and mercy. But it's also deeply joyful because we are so keenly aware of God's presence at all times. The most beautiful part of my day every day is when we begin to sing the Fos Hilleron at Vespers. And no matter how anxious, angry, or depressed I've been earlier in the day, the Holy Spirit lifts me up as I remember with gratitude that God is worthy at all times to be praised with happy voices. 
Religious communities have been called a school for the service of the Lord because living in community actually makes it easier to grow in holiness. But the truth is that it's not just for religious or other Christian communities like ours. It is for every Christian and every church community. In chapter 9 of our rule, titled Of Community and Holiness, we state that we live in community because all life created by God exists in communal order and works towards community. The vocation of those in religious and other Christian communities is not the vocation of a special kind of Christian, but is like the vocation of bishops, priests, and deacons, an iconic vocation, revealing in an especially tangible way something that is true of all the baptized. Religious life is a specific vocation, a call, but it is the goal of every Christian to attain purity of heart meaning putting growth in holiness and relationship with Christ first above all else, and to do that within the body of Christ. As we heard this morning, when Jesus called to them, Peter, Andrew, James, and John responded immediately. They left their jobs, their families, and everything they knew, and followed Jesus at once. They became part of Jesus' small community of apostles, and his larger community of disciples. Their call was not to religious life, but to life in the body of Christ. And in fact, both while they were with Jesus and after his ascension, they lived as part of communities of disciples, kind of like the ones we heard about in Acts 2 and 4. So I ask you, I want you to look around. Look at the people you're in church with today. God calls us to be in community with the specific people in the parish we're in and to discern the vocation not only of each member but of the congregation as a body. In other words, we've all been called here because this is where we can best grow in holiness and this is where the Holy Spirit will help us to do God's work in the building up of the kingdom. So I wonder if this might be a good time to ask ourselves some questions. How well are we, like Peter, Andrew, James, and John, answering Christ's call right now and in this place to follow him and live in the community he founded, the body of Christ, the church? And how are we, as a small community of St. Paul's, and the larger community of the church living into the type of communities described in Acts 2 and 4, where following Christ comes first, where people's lives are deeply intertwined, where they're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of the bread, to fellowship, to prayers, where the whole group of those who believe are of one heart and soul, and there is not a needy person among them because they share whatever they have. and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. 
And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in thy mercy. Give grace, O heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Doug, our bishop, Michelle, our priest, and Debbie, our deacon, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. Lord, in thy mercy, Hear our and to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. Lord, in thy mercy, Hear our we beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, especially Joe, our president, Eric, our governor, and Tom, our mayor, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Lord, in thy mercy. Yeah. Open, O oh Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. Lord, in thy mercy. Yeah. We most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor Marilyn, Father Rob Rhodes, Sue, Pat, Dan, Tom, Sally, Craig, Hannah and Baby Humphrey, Sandy, Greg, Mary, Alda, Gordy, Tom, Winnie, Lauren, Helen, Barb, and Doris, all immigrants, refugees, and prisoners, and all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in thy mercy. We commend to your gracious care in keeping all the men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad, especially Raymond, Megan, and Carson. Defend them day by day with thy heavenly grace and grant them a sense of thy abiding presence wherever they may be. Lord, in thy mercy. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, remembering especially your servant Mark, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, St. Paul, and all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Lord, in thy mercy. Amen. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, Guide the nations of the world into the way of justice and truth, and establish among them that peace which is the fruit of righteousness, that they may become the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, in thy mercy. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Which we, through 
time of time must be the sea that I live. Thy thought, a word indeed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of that is grievous unto us, the burden of that is intolerable. Have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that have passed. And grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and through faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness. And bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, to the end that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. At this time, we would pray for birthdays and anniversaries, but I do not have any listed on my sheet. Am I missing anyone's birthday or anniversary? Okay, the peace of the Lord be always with you then. Please be seated for announcements. I have but one. Today is our annual meeting directly after the dismissal. And after the annual meeting, we will go downstairs for a celebratory breakfast. I hope you can join us for both. However, count to see if we would have quorum. Everybody who is here, we have two extra people for quorum. So that means if you're here, I really expect you to stay for the meeting, or we're going to have to defer it until next week. I'm not trying to put anyone on the spot. Nobody knows what we're talking about. If you were not planning on staying for the annual meeting, could you raise your hand right now? I promise not to uh, point you out, but fair enough. Everyone else is staying. If everyone else stays, we will be glorious. Thank you. We'll make it as quick as possible. Worthy art, thou, worthy art thou, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and by thy will they were created and have their being.
God, our Heavenly Father, for that thou of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made thereby as one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior, Savior, Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and be filled with thy grace and <coughs> heavenly benediction, and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ our Lord. By whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, 
we have all to say.
we most heartily thank thee for that thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members and corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. 